Hello, we'll be reading book 24 of the Iliad today, translated by Robert Fagels. If you're reading our version from class, book 24 begins on page 588. It is entitled Achilles and Priam. I'll be skipping around a little bit, but I will notify you of the lines when I do so. So let's begin. The games were over now. The gathered armies scattered, each man to his fast ship, and fighters turned their minds to thoughts of food and the sweet warm grip of sleep. But Achilles kept on grieving for his friend, the memory burning on, and in all subduing sleep could not take him, not now. He turned and twisted side to side. He longed for Patroclus' manhood, his gallant heart. What rough campaigns they'd fought to an end together. What hardships they had suffered cleaving their way through the wars of men in pounding waves at sea. The memories flooded over him, live tears flowing, and now he'd lie on his side, now flat on his back, now face down again. At last he leaped to his feet, wander in anguish, aimless along the surf, and dawn on dawn, flaming over the sea, and shore would find him pacing. Then he'd yoke his racing team to the chariot harness, lash the corpse of Hector behind the car for dragging, and haul him three times round the dead Patroclus' tomb. And then he'd rest again in his tents and leave the body sprawled face down in the dust. But Apollo pitied Hector, dead man though he was, and warded all corruption off from Hector's corpse, and round him head to foot the great god wrapped the golden shield of storm, so his skin would never rip as Achilles dragged him on. And so he kept on raging, shaming noble Hector. But the gods in bliss looked down and pitied Priam's son. So I'm going to skip ahead. The gods discuss how Achilles continues to rage, how he shows no empathy, how he is inhuman in his iron heart. Um, and eventually Zeus decrees that Priam shall be allowed to have Hector back. Iris goes to tell Priam, Thetis goes to tell Achilles, and then Priam makes preparations to move, um, carry a wagon of priceless ransom out to Achilles down into the Greek camps. But of course, no one believes Priam. They think he's just gone crazy. And so we are going to skip over to line 361, page 598, book 24, line 361. Priam rinsed his hands, took the cup from his wife, and taking a stand amidst the forecourt, prayed, pouring the wine to the earth and scanning the high skies. Priam prayed in his rich, resounding voice, Father Zeus, ruling over us all from Ida, God of greatness, God of glory. Grant that Achilles will receive me with kindness, mercy. Send me a bird of omen, your own wind-swift messenger, the dearest bird in the world to your prophetic heart, the strongest thing on wings, clear on the right, so I can see that sign with my own eyes and trust my life to it as I venture down to Achaea's ships and the fast chariot teams. And Zeus, in all his wisdom, heard that prayer. And straightaway the father launched an eagle, truest of Zeus's signs that fly the skies, the dark marauder that the mankind calls the black wing, broad as the door of a rich man's vaulted treasure chamber, well fitted with sturdy bars, so broad each wing of the bird spread out on either side as it swept in through the city, flashing clear on the right before the king and queen. All looked up, overjoyed, the people's spirits lifted. And the old man, rushing to climb aboard his chariot, drove out through the gates and echoing colonnades. The mules in the lead hauled out the four-wheeled wagon driven on by seasoned Idaeus. The horses came behind as the old man cracked the lash and urged them fast throughout the city with all his kinsmen trailing, weeping their hearts out as if he went to his death. But once the two passed down through crowded streets and out into open country, Priam's kin turned back his sons and in-laws straggling home to Troy. And so Priam crosses the plain. We're going to skip ahead again. Uh, Zeus sends Hermes to guide Priam. Hermes wraps him kind of in an invisibility shield so that no one sees them, no one hears them. 
and he leads Priam all the way through the Greek encampment up to the very doorstep of Achilles' uh, tent, I guess. All right, so we're going to go to the very bottom of page 603. Uh, Hermes leaves Priam, and Priam is now at the doorstep of Achilles' tent. We're on line, book 24, line 550. Priam swung down to earth from the battle car, and leaving Idaeus there to rein in the mules and team, the old king went straight up to the lodge, where Achilles, dear to Zeus, would always sit. Priam found the warrior there inside. Many captains sitting some way off, but two, veteran Automedon and the fine fighter alchemist, were busy serving him. He had just finished dinner, eating, drinking, and the table still stood near. The majestic king of Troy slipped past the rest, and kneeling down beside Achilles, clasped his knees and kissed his hands, those terrible man-killing hands that had slaughtered Priam's many sons in battle. Awesome, as when the grip of madness seizes one who murders a man in his own fatherland and flees abroad to foreign shores to a wealthy noble host and a sense of marvel runs through all who see him. So Achilles marveled, beholding majestic Priam. His men marveled too, trading startled glances. But Priam prayed his heart out to Achilles. Remember your own father, great godlike Achilles, as old as I am, past the threshold of deadly old age. No doubt the countrymen round about him plague him now, with no one there to defend him, beat away disaster. No one. But at least he hears you're still alive, and his old heart rejoices, hopes rising day by day to see his beloved son come sailing home from Troy. But I, dear God, my life so cursed by fate, I fathered heroes' sons in the wide realm of Troy, and now not a single one is left, I tell you. Fifty sons I had when the sons of Achaea came, nineteen born to me from a single mother's womb, and the rest by other women in the palace. Many, most of them, violent Ares cut the knees from under. But one, one was left to me, to guard my walls, my people, the one you killed the other day, defending his fatherland, my Hector. It's all for him I've come to the ships now. To win him back from you, I bring a priceless ransom. Revere the gods, Achilles. Pity me in my own right. Remember your own father. I deserve more pity. I have endured what no one on earth has ever done before. I put to my lips the hands of the man who killed my son. Those words stirred within Achilles a deep desire to grieve for his own father. Taking the old man's hand, he gently moved him back, and overpowered by memory, both men gave way to grief. Priam wept freely for man-killing Hector, throbbing, crouching before Achilles' feet as Achilles wept himself, now for his father, now for Patroclus once again, and their sobbing rose and fell throughout the house. Then, when brilliant Achilles had had his fill of tears, and the longing for it had left his mind and body, he rose from his seat, raised the old man by the hand, and filled with pity now for his gray head and gray beard, he spoke out, winging words, flying straight to the heart. Poor man, how much you've borne, pain to break the spirit. What daring brought you down to the ships all alone to face the glance of the man who killed your son, so many fine, brave boys? You have a heart of iron. Come, please sit down on this chair here. Let us put our griefs to rest in our own hearts, Rake them up no more raw as we are with mourning. What's good to be won from tears that chill the spirit? So the immortals spun our lives that we, we wretched men, live on to bear such torment. The gods live free of sorrows. There are two great jars that stand on the floor of Zeus's halls and hold his gifts. Our miseries one, the other blessings. When Zeus, who loves the lightning, mixes gifts for a man, now he meets with misfortune, now good times in turn. 
when Zeus, who loves the lightning, only dispenses gifts from the jar of sorrows, he makes a man an outcast. Brutal, ravenous hunger drives him down the face of the shining earth, stalking far and wide, cursed by gods and men. So with my father Peleus, what glittering gifts the gods rained down from the day that he was born. He excelled all men in wealth and pride of place. He lorded the Myrmidons, the mortal that he was. They gave the man an immortal goddess for a wife. Yes, but even on him the father piled hardships. No powerful race of princes born in his royal halls. Only a single son he fathered, doomed at birth, cut off in the spring of life. And I, I give the man no care as he grows old, since here I sit in Troy, far from my fatherland, a grief to you, a grief to all your children. And you too, old man, we hear you prospered once, as far as Lesbos, Macker's kingdom, bounds to seaward, Phrygia east and upland, the Hellespont vast to north, that entire realm, they say, you lorded over once. You excelled all men, old king, in sons and wealth. But then the gods of heaven brought this agony on you. Ceaseless battles round your walls, your armies slaughtered. You must bear up now. Enough of endless tears, the pain that breaks the spirit. Grief for your son will do no good at all. He will never bring him back to life. Sooner, you must suffer something worse. But the old and noble Priam protested strongly. Don't make me sit on a chair, Achilles Prince. Not while Hector lies uncared for in your camp. Give him back to me now. No more delay. I must see my son with my own eyes. Accept the ransom I bring you. A king's ransom. Enjoy it. All of it. Return to your own native land, safe and sound, since now you've spared my life. A dark glance. And the headstrong runner answered, No more, old man. Don't tempt my wrath. Not now. My own mind's made up to give back your son. A messenger brought me word from Zeus, my mother, Thetis, who bore me the old man of the sea's daughter. And what's more, I can see through you, Priam. No hiding the fact from me. One of the gods has led you down to Achaea's fast ships. No man alive, not even a rugged young fighter, would dare to venture into our camp. Never. How could he slip past the sentries unchallenged, or shoot back the bolt of my gates with so much ease? So don't anger me now. Don't stir my raging heart still more, or under my roof I may not spare your life, old man, suppliant that you are, may break the laws of Zeus. The old man was terrified. He obeyed the order. But Achilles bound out of the doors like a lion, not alone, but flanked by his two aides in arms, veteran Automedon and alchemist, steady comrades, Achilles' favorites next to the dead Patroclus. They loosed from his harness the horses and the mules. They led the herald in, the old king's crier, and sat him down on a bench. From the polished wagon they lifted the priceless ransom brought for Hector's corpse. But they left behind two capes and a finely woven shirt to shroud the body well when Priam bore him home. Then Achilles called the serving women out. Bathe and anoint the body. Bear it aside first. Priam must not see his son. He feared that, overwhelmed by the sight of Hector, wild with grief, Priam might let his anger flare, and Achilles might fly into a fresh rage himself, cut the old man down, and break the laws of Zeus. So when the maids had bathed and anointed the body, sleek with olive oil, and wrapped it round and round in a braided battle shirt and handsome battle cape, then Achilles lifted Hector up in his own arms, laid him down on a bier, and comrades helped him raise that bier and the body into the sturdy wagon. Then with a groan, he called his dear friend by name. Feel no anger at me, Patroclus, if you learn. Even there in the house of death, I let his father have Prince Hector back. He gave me a worthy ransom, and you shall have your share from me as always, your fitting, lordly share. So he vowed, and brilliant Achilles strode back to his shelter, sat down on the well-carved chair that he had left, at the far wall of the room, leaned toward Priam and firmly spoke the words the king had come to hear. Your son is now set free, old man, as you requested. Hector lies in state. With the first light of day, you will see for yourself as you convey him home. Now at last, let us 
turn our thoughts to supper. So I'm going to skip ahead again. There is a couple of pages description of, of course, Greek hospitality, Xenia, as Achilles feeds Priam, and they share a meal together. And then Achilles allows him to sleep there in the tent. Uh, but I'm going to skip over to line 771. It's the very top of page 610. So book 24, 771. Achilles has one more offer to make Priam before Priam departs. Book 24, line 771. Tell me, be precise about it. How many days do you need to bury Prince Hector? I will hold back myself and keep the Argive armies back that long. And the old and noble Priam answered slowly, If you truly want me to give Prince Hector burial, full royal honors, you'd show me a great kindness, Achilles, if you would do exactly as I say. You know how crammed we are inside our city, how far it is to the hills to haul in timber, and our Trojans are afraid to make the journey. Well, nine days we should mourn him in our halls. On the tenth we'd bury Hector, hold the public feast. On the eleventh build the barrow high above his body. On the twelfth we'd fight again, if fight we must. The swift runner Achilles reassured him quickly. All will be done, old Priam, as you command. I will hold our attack as long as you require. With that, he clasped the old king by the wrist, by the right hand, to free his heart from fear. Then Priam and Harold, mind set on the journey home, bedded down for the night within the porch's shelter, and deep in his sturdy, well-built lodge, Achilles slept with Briseis in all her beauty, sleeping by, her si by his side. So we're going to skip ahead again, just a couple of lines. Um, Hermes comes, wakes up Priam, tells him to get Idaeus and head back before dawn finds them in the Greek camp. So I'm going to skip over to line um, 813 on page 611, line 813, where Priam is driving Hector back to Troy. Once they reached the ford where the river runs clear, the strong whirling Xanthus sprung of immortal Zeus, Hermes went his way to the steep heights of Olympus as dawn flung out her golden robe across the earth, and the two men, weeping, groaning, drove the team toward Troy, and the mules brought on the body. No one saw them at first, neither man nor woman, none before Cassandra, golden as goddess Aphrodite. She had climbed to Pergamus's heights, and from that point she saw her beloved father swaying tall in the chariot flanked by the herald, whose cry could rouse the city. And Cassandra saw him, too. Drawn by the mules and stretched out on his bier, she screamed, and her scream rang out through all Troy. Come, look down, you men of Troy, you Trojan women. Behold Hector now. If you ever once rejoiced to see him striding home, home alive from battle, he was the greatest joy of Troy and all our people. Her cries plunged Troy into uncontrollable grief, and not a man or woman was left inside the walls. They streamed out at the gates to meet Priam, bringing in the body of dead. Hector, his loving wife and noble mother, were first to fling themselves on the wagon rolling on, the first to tear their hair, embrace his head, and a wailing throng of people milled around them, and now all day long till the setting sun went down they would have wept for Hector there before the gates if the old man steering the cart had not commanded, Let me through with the mules. Soon, in a moment, you can have your fill of tears. Once I've brought him home. So he called and the crowds fell back on either side, making way for the wagon. Once they had borne him into the famous halls, they laid his body down on his large carved bed and set beside him singers to lead off the laments, and their voices rose in grief. They lifted the dirge high as the women wailed in answer, and white-armed Andromache led their songs of sorrow, cradling the head of Hector, man-killing Hector gently in her arms. Oh, my husband, cut off from life so young, you leave me a widow lost in royal halls, and the boy only a baby, the son we bore together, you and I so doomed. 
I cannot think he will ever come to manhood. Long before that, the city will be sacked, plundered top to bottom. Because you are dead, her great guardian, you who always defended Troy, who kept her loyal wives and helpless children safe, all who will soon be carried off in the hollow ships and I with them. And you, my child, will follow me to labor somewhere at harsh, degrading work, slaving under some heartless master's eye. That or some Achaean marauder will seize you by the arm and hurl you headlong down from the ramparts. Horrible death. Enraged at you because Hector once cut down his brother, his father, or his son. Yes, hundreds of armed Achaeans gnawed the dust of the world, crushed by Hector's hands. Your father, remember, was no man of mercy, not in the horror of battle. And that is why the whole city of Troy mourns you now, my Hector. You have brought your parents accursed tears and grief. But to me, most of all, you left the horror, the heartbreak. For you never died in bed and stretched your arms to me, or said some last word from the heart I can remember always weeping for you through all my nights and days. Her voice rang out in tears, and the women wailed in answer, and Hecuba led them now in a throbbing chant of sorrow. Hector, dearest to me by far of all my sons, and dear to the gods why we still shared this life, and they cared about you still, I see, even after death. Many the sons I had, whom the swift runner Achilles caught and shipped on the barren salt seas as slaves to Samnos, to Imbros, to Lemnos, shrouded deep in mist, but you, once he slashed away your life with his brazen spear, he dragged you time and again around his comrade's tomb, Patroclus, whom you killed. Not that he brought Patroclus back to life by that. But I have you with me now. Fresh as the morning dew, you lie in the royal halls, like one whom Apollo, lord of the silver bow, has approached and shot to death with gentle shafts. Her voice rang out in tears, and an endless wail rose up, and Helen, the third in turn, led their songs of sorrow. Hector, dearest to me of all my husband's brothers, my husband Paris, magnificent as a god, he was the one who brought me here to Troy. Oh, how I wish I died before that day. But this now is the twentieth year for me since I sailed here and forsook my own native land, yet never once did I hear from you a taunt, an insult. But if someone else in the royal halls would curse me, one of your brothers or sisters or brothers' wives trailing their long robes, even your own mother, not your father, always kind as my own father, why, you'd restrain them with words, Hector. You'd win them to my side, you with your gentle temper, all your gentle words. And so in the same breath I mourn for you and me, my doom-struck, harrowed heart. Now there is no one left in the wide realm of Troy, no friend to treat me kindly. All the countrymen cringe from me in loathing. Her voice rang out in tears, and vast throngs wailed, and old King Priam rose and gave his people orders. Now, you men of Troy, haul timber into the city. Have no fear of an Argive ambush packed with danger. Achilles vowed when he sent me home from the black ships not to do us harm till the twelfth dawn arrives. At his command, they harnessed oxen and mules to wagon. They assembled before the city walls, and with all good speed, for nine days hauled in a boundless store of timber. But when the tenth dawn brought light to the mortal world, they carried gallant Hector forth, weeping tears, and they placed his corpse aloft the pyre's crest, flung a torch, and set it all aflame. At last, when young dawn with her rose-red fingers shone once more, the people massed around illustrious Hector's pyre. And once they gather, crowding the meeting grounds, they first put out the fires with glistening wine, wherever the flames still burned in all their fury. Then they collected the white bones of Hector, all his brothers, his friends in arms, mourning, and warm tears came streaming down their cheeks. They placed the bones they found in a golden chest, shrouding them round and round in soft purple cloths. They quickly lowered the chest in a deep, hollow grave, and over it piled a cot of huge stones closely set. Then hastily heaped a barrow, posted lookouts all around, for fear a key and combat troops would launch their attacks before the time agreed. 
and once they'd heaped the mound, they turned back home to Troy, and gathering once again they shared a splendid funeral feast in Hector's honor, held in the house of Priam, king by will of Zeus. And so the Trojans buried Hector, breaker of horses. And so ends the Iliad, translated by Robert Fagels. Thank you for listening.